Living room logic. Welcome back to another episode of Living Room Logic. And this week we have something particularly interesting because we're going to be talking about something which everyone who listens often knows is quite close to me, but we're going to be talking about sex differences. But something which is quite interesting to everyone is sex differences in things like performance and things like training. And today we are very, very lucky to talk to David Nolan, who is a researcher pursuing his PhD in DCU in sex differences in exercise and exercise performance. And what we're going to be talking about is these sex differences that apply to training and performance. And I think it'd be particularly interesting to women in particular, obviously, but really anyone interested in sports and looking at the differences between, let's say, male and female sports and trying to understand how what's going on behind the scenes might be different and how what's going on behind the scenes might be better optimized. Does that sound like something we could talk about, David? I'm sure we'll be able to stick our teeth into it, all right? Unbelievable. So I think just to kind of get this off off the off the board and running, could we talk about what you're actually up to and what you're doing and what your research is specifically focused on so we have a baseline to kind of hop off? Academically, as you said, I do my PhD in DCU and then I lecture down in Technological University of the Shannon, the Midlands campus there. Um, and we also have the She Research Group there, so some good female-based research going on there. So what I look at, as you said, is sex differences in adaptation to exercise. So when we exercise, how we respond to it and whether males and females respond differently. Now, I do that through the lens of women's rugby or female rugby. So they're kind of the focus of the research, the participants we use. But really, it's the, they're just one means to answer these broad questions and investigate these broad questions so the type of questions we look at is does the menstrual cycle have a role in performance does it influence how we perform and recover what about hormonal contraceptive use does that have an impact and then do males and females respond differently to act the actual training itself because most of our training studies to date have been done on male participants and we know how males respond but we know that males and females are different biologically and physiologically so maybe the way they respond to stimulus or to exercise is going to be different. So that is essentially what we're looking at. So we've done a series of studies. Of course, COVID came in the way that we weren't able to do some of the nice lab-based ones we intended to do at the start. So we had to push those back. But where we are at now, we're about to go into hopefully the final phase of data collection in, in the PhD, where we're bringing different participants in across different phases of menstrual cycle and testing them in a performance battery, what we call so different tests to see how to perform. And then by bringing them in across, say, two menstrual cycles, we get to see, well, does the phase of the menstrual cycle you're in have an impact on performance? And then does it vary between cycle to cycle? Um, and we'll use male match controls to kind of eliminate this idea of biological variability or help account for it. And then we'll also um, use hormonal contraceptive user, users as controls as well to see if there's any differences there. So that's kind of the fundamental question we're investigating and how we're going to do it. And then to follow on from that, if you know if we do find potential differences, ideally what we'd like to do is follow people across a whole training um, plan and across months of training to see, well, if you're on contraceptives, do you respond differently? If you train a certain way in a certain phase, your mental cycle, could that lead to potentially better gains or better adaptation? So these are the broad questions we, we have to answer. So it's, as you know yourself, Andrew, um, in the area of sex differences, there's a lot of different rabbit holes and complexities you can go into. And maybe I think I naively entered the field kind of thinking, well, the reason that, you know, these high quality studies haven't been done to date is the researchers were lazy and they weren't willing to put in the work. And then I think everyone enters a PhD with some sort of naive arrogance and optimism. And then when you get into it, you realize, well, actually, it is really complex. And there's a reason no one has done it too well uh, so far. And there's a lot of difficulties that get, get thrown up there. Absolutely. And I think that's just from the sound of what you're doing, you're really nailing the method design and which is a huge issue in uh, studying sex differences of actually trying to make sure you're looking at females at the right stages of their menstrual cycle, which within itself is quite complicated to try and do that accurately and consistently and to then have the experimental design flexible enough that when someone is ready to go, you are ready to go. 
So I, I can, expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was that's a whole a, a, another aspect of sex differences where uh, you have a choice. You either half the amount of results you can get, or double the money you're given because you have to do everything for the males and females. And what uh, which rugby clubs are you working with? So we're not based in rugby clubs. So some of the projects we don't have been in um, conjunction with the IRFU and uh, some of the ones we've done around say data performance and performance analysis at that level. And for the the final one. We'll probably do the data collection around the Dublin and Athlone areas uh, across two two sites. So we'll be recruiting from pretty much any any clubs that we can get participants from, essentially, um, because one of the big problems you have with research in general, but especially sex difference research, is a lot of it is underpowered. And what we mean by that is just not enough participants in it. So when we get into it, we will obviously try to recruit as many rugby players as we can. We may expand that, that it's field-based players just to bring our sample size up potentially, but that's one of the issues. So anyone and everyone that would be willing to come along, because again, if we are to say track uh, female across two menstrual cycles, that's probably a 10 week period. We're going to have to collect data across to ensure that we do actually capture two complete menstrual cycles. So that's a big commitment for someone to come in uh, one day per week for 10 weeks at minimum. Sounds like a lot. Sounds like a lot. A lot of organizing, especially now. But some, something you touched on is uh, something I can absolutely relate to is the kind of naivety of going in with a lot of optimism and stuff. But regarding training, uh, the questions you're asking to me, and I have heard this a lot before in sex differences research in particular, you're asking quite front end questions you're asking questions that people would assume have been looked at a long time ago questions very like just how is performance and exercise efficiency going at different stages which you'd think would have been looked at by olympic athletes maybe 30 years ago of how to optimize that kind of stuff but this is happening today so looking at this is this across the field new like looking at these sex differences and how to optimize training is it is it fresh or is it something you're building on so i suppose it's not completely new in terms of we're just finishing off uh, a large meta-analysis um where and the meta-analysis where we gather a lot of different research basically we summarize the research done to date and we take all the data and put it into nice statistical models to kind of make one large study from it but what our question in that meta-analysis is, do females and males respond differently following matched training protocols? So when we have any, so our inclusion criteria, and we're looking in the young population, so 18 to 40 years of age. So we've gone through and looked for any study where they have, and the focus of the study might not have been sex differences, but we just wanted any study where a male and female cohort have followed a matched training protocol. So they've done the same resistance training to see if we have any differences in outcomes in strength or, or muscle growth. Now, again, your naivety with that systematic review, because um, in terms of that meta-analysis, I sent off the data set this morning to the statistician, but we have 63 studies fully extracted from that. And you can imagine within the, a lot of the research didn't actually focus on sex differences. So they reported the group average. Yes. So I, for any of those, you know, your easy way out in that case is to just say, we exclude this paper because it didn't report sex differences. Yes. We decided to email the authors of every study and try to get the raw data where possible. So that's how we've ended up with such a large um, data set. But I was looking for, I came on just to, around that question of, well, is it, is, is it new the, when we reviewed all the full text, the earliest paper that met the criteria for review of full text was from 1977. So we have, okay. and it actually had sex differences in the title in response oh, to exercise. So we have some studies from the 1970s, but then it kind of went out of kilter. There was a few handful of very small underpowered studies that didn't show a difference, but then the sensitivity, the measures weren't great. The, as you said, the standardization of how they control for different things wasn't wasn't great. So it has been studied. It's not a new concept, but it hasn't been studied well. And even when we look at some of the seminal meta-analyses that were published in the last couple of years around the menstrual cycle and its effect on performance, hormonal contraceptive and its effect on performance, we see that there has been a decent body of literature done to date, but 
almost all of that literature was rated as poor quality, poor to moderate quality with very few high quality studies. So while we would say that the evidence or the science to date doesn't show that the menstrual cycle has a strong effect, doesn't show that hormonal contraceptive has a strong effect, the level of the standard of the studies that are out there just haven't been high quality enough. And that's for a lot of reasons. It's very difficult logistically and financially to do really high quality research in this area. Absolutely. And I think you you really hit on something there, which I have heard a lot, where when you get into a certain point where you get regulations that you have to include uh, males and females in studies, that doesn't necessarily mean people are going to separate them and observe the sex differences. I know in the neurosciences, which is where I'm based, there was a um, systematic analysis that took all papers in 2007 and compared them to all papers in 2017 and looked at how sex differences research has improved. And it went, it was a huge increase from something like 10% of papers, including males and females, to 60%, including males and females. But then they looked at the methodology to see how many, what was the increase in effective sex differences analysis, and it went from 2% to 4%. So it really, even though they were forcing males and females into the study, they were just averaging them out, which defeats the purpose in many ways. And we see it the same in the sports sciences. We have a, a large scale review from 2014 looking at the gender gap in sport and exercise sciences. And we see that 30% of participants at that to date at that stage were female. So you could say that females are largely underrepresented within the sports sciences. And what's interesting, the majority of those, when you dig into that data, the majority of those female participants were in large scale endurance sports trials. So about, you know, running, cycling, these type of sports. But where my interest is more around muscle physiology and strength and growing muscle and that's, and which I could speak all day about that, it's importance of strength and hypertrophy for healthy aging and health in general, they're much less there. So while there, and again, there's some cliche statements where people say, oh, there's no research on females. That's not true. 30% of all participants is not that there's no research. Now, there's very little at the high level, but there's very little in elite athletes in general. And one of the kind of banal statements that we hear put out there, but just because something's a banality doesn't mean it's, it's, it's not true, is you hear people say, we don't need just more research. We need more high quality research. And I think that's probably the same in neuroscience. It's probably the same across science as a whole in terms of the system is designed for publish or perish kind of um, thing. And we want people, especially when it comes to sex differences, to do the high quality research is time consuming. It's resource heavy. So we need to kind of shift our perspective there that it's not just about getting more females into research. It's just about getting more high quality research with females and focusing on these sex differences appropriately. That's phenomenal. And just before we dig into exactly that biology, which you said you could talk all day about, which will get you going a good bit in a second, just scratch a niche for me. In the meta analysis you just did, would you say you had to do more or less than half of going back into the studies and separating out the sexes. So how, yeah. Okay, so I think if I, I, numbers are rough here, but yeah. say of the one, all the papers that would have fit the criteria for to be included in study, there was a little over a hundred that, okay, this, if we get this data, it is okay. I think I emailed well over 60 authors looking for the original data set. So out of so 60% didn't report sex differences in the paper. So it would have recruited males and females, okay. but just reported the group mean, which made it difficult. And again, I, I th I'm an advocate for open science. Once mm -hmm. we publish it, all the raw data will be there on open science framework. It would make it so much easier if we could have just accessed male and female. Yes, of course. And a lot, a lot, um, Again, one of the good principles of science is show the data. We, we, we know that. Um, but yeah, so the, that was probably one of the biggest challenges because in our methodology, it was email all the authors request for the data set. If you got no reply, you email again two weeks later. If you get no reply, you email for a third and final time at the four week mark. So you've given three opportunities yes. to provide data. So if you're doing that for 50 or 60 different papers and then also the email on the email address on the paper from 2010 
might not that be. more than likely that author is now in a different university. So then I had to go and try find the author online and see where they are now. And it was that was tough. I'd say that was a long week. <laughs> yeah, that was a long At couple least. of months. <laughs> yeah, I would say so. All right. Let's let's get back to it. Sorry, I just I had to I had to scratch that itch because I was just wondering. Okay, so now let, let's dig into exactly what's going on under the surface and exactly where these sex differences are coming from. So when we're talking about exercise and the biology and the performance, tell me about what's different between the male and female body where you have to start separating them and especially in the context of the menstrual cycle. Tell, tell me tell me the difference, the main differences like that you would summarize. Yeah, so it's interesting and somewhat even contentious to say this in modern society, but males and females are different. Biological males and females are quite different. And this we see before even birth, we have this surge of testosterone, obviously, in, in, in uh, males that causes difference. But the big divergence comes at the onset of puberty. And especially in, in male puberty, we have, you could say testosterone is one, everyone tries to put everything down to testosterone, but that's only one yeah hormone of, of several different and several different factors are going on. But basically at puberty, we have this divergence and we have this growth and development and we lead to then this difference between males and females and in some of the factors that affect performance. So body composition, first of all, males are generally taller on average. Now people will see, oh, well, I know a small male versus just because there's crossover in a data set doesn't mean that on average, the two groups are very different. So on average, males are taller, they have more muscle mass and have less body fat. Now, that means that for any given body weight, they have a higher proportion of muscle to compare to a female of the same body weight. Why does that matter in sport? Well, sport is essentially about producing force. Our muscles produce force that allows us to run, jump, throw, hit, push, whatever it may be. Well, at any given body weight, if you have a higher proportion of muscle, that means you have more capacity to produce force. So you probably have an advantage in sport. In, in terms of that's why athletes spend so much time in the gym is to make their muscles better at producing force. Like That's why soccer players go in the gym. If they're better at producing force, they can jump higher, run faster, and they're less likely to get injured. So I think everyone tends to focus on the muscle mass first and foremost. And then the other one that people will intuitively know is strength. Males on average are much, much stronger than uh, females in both upper and lower body strength. But where, so they're the two main factors you probably hear people discuss. And, you know, when you go into testosterone suppression even, and can you revert it and all that kind of thing. But there's other things that people don't talk about. Bones, for example, males have longer and stronger bones compared to the average female tendon properties so the tendons that connect our muscles to our bones we see that the male tendons are able to produce higher levels of force they have higher levels of stiffness this means that they're less likely to injure and rupture so if you have two individuals running into each other and say one is has a higher level of body mass and higher level of force production but also what attaches their muscles to their bones is stronger than say a female so male and female run into each other the male is bigger, stronger, but also their tendons that attach the muscle to the bone is stronger. And then when that tendon attaches to a bone, it's attaching to a bone that is stronger than as well. So they're kind of the physical makeups, you could say, in terms of the size, strength, tendons and bones. But then if you get into some of the physio physiology side of stuff, so VO2 max or ability to utilize oxygen. So people will often kind of understand this where you see the athlete on the treadmill with the tubes in, in the mouth and they're breathing and running. But that is a measure of aerobic fitness. So your ability basically to exercise hard and endurance sports, so sports like running or cycling. Males have both a higher absolute relative uh, and relative VO2 max. Respiratory function, pulmonary ventilation, how much air you can take in and out. Males have a higher level of that as well. And then when we get into cardiovascular function, we see that the male heart is larger, the left ventricle mass is larger, cardiac output, how much blood you can pump around, um, a pump out a heart in a minute, that's higher. Stroke volume at both rest and maximal is far, far higher. Um, so stroke volume, the, the amount of blood coming out of the heart in, a, in a, a single beat, cardiac output, how much blood we can push around the body in a minute. And then our hemoglobin, our amount of red blood cells that carry the oxygen around the body and allows exercise 
that content is higher in males compared to females. So people might know of altitude training where athletes go up into the mountains to train at altitude. The reason to do that is to increase their hemoglobin content. And males on average have 11% higher hemoglobin than females. So if you were to get that from altitude training, you wouldn't get those type of increases from altitude training. So they have this uh, um, distinct difference. And you could say, well, so what? If males and females are different, does it lead to a performance advantage? And it does. All those things lead to a distinct male advantage within sport. Now, when you estimate what that is, there are some sports where it's lower. So kind of down, if you take rowing, swimming, these type of sports, we see on average males have 10 to 13% advantage. If you go up into stuff that's really high force output, so your weightlifting, your, say, throwing a cricket ball, throwing a baseball, it's above 50% is the average advantage here. Like there's one statistic you will hear about if you look at world record times, and you take the female world record 100 meter sprinter, there are roughly about 10,000 males who have run faster than that. So you could take the world record holder in females, and 10,000 roughly males have documented times quicker than the female. Now, they're simply facts, they're biological facts. And just by stating them, there's no judgment being placed on that. And that's people will say, it's like, well, what's the point of this? You're just trying to show oh, males are superior than females like no what i'm saying is males and females are biologically and structurally and anatomically whatever way you want to phrase it are different these differences do confer an advantage to males in sport this is why it's not we're pitting males against females it's one of the reasons we have these separate separation of sports categories where it's not that oh how do we get the females up to the standard of males it's not what we're trying to do we're trying to help females to be one, better than themselves, and then in the sporting context, be more competitive than their competitors. It's not about we want to mm-hmm. kind of eliminate this gap between males and females. That's not the aim of sex differences research to say, well, how can the females catch up? It's, well, if we acknowledge there are differences, well, then maybe there's differences that we need in the support system we give to our female athletes. Because if you want to even go in terms of sex differences outside of physiology, We can talk about sports participation. We don't have enough girls and women and females playing sport. And we know that sport is integral for physical health, mental health. And even if you go to the United Nations and the WHO's global action plans, it's clear that sport is integral to peace and sustainability and development in in developing countries and, and globally as well. So that's where it comes down to as well. If we acknowledge there are differences and we then say, well, then there might be differences in sport. You know, we want more, we want as many people as possible to play a sport, not just competitively, but socially mm-hmm. as well. So how can we better support females? And I think it's, it'd be disrespectful to say, well, there's no differences or we just treat everyone the same. One small example, if you take um, female participation in team sports, we see a big dropout in adolescent girls in team sports. And one of the potential um, barriers can that can be self-consciousness around, say, the menstrual cycle. Well, one small tweak that um, seems to can make a big difference. We don't um, force teenage girls to wear white shorts when they play sport. We say, oh, well, everyone wears black shorts. And now the, we eliminate, well, not eliminate, but we reduce the self-consciousness around, well, what if I have spotting, menstrual spotting, or if I, what if I'm on my period or I have, Um, a menstrual bleed while playing sport if we have and if you're in bright white on eel shorts that's obviously something you would be very self-conscious of so it's these little tweaks that we can potentially make that make a big difference yeah to just to track back uh to something you were saying earlier on and you were saying the biological differences which is it's fascinating to think about but all of those differences are pound for pound. They're not necess- They're not just um, men have more bone because they're bigger. There, if you took a two hundred pounds six foot male and six foot female, those are all pound for pound differences. In, in most, it's yeah it's, on average. On on average, yeah. But and and this is probably the big thing when we come to strength and hypertrophy, the ability to gain muscle and and build strength in the gym. The research we have to date, now again, we'll wait for the results of our meta-analysis and hopefully 
if it's in line with say previous research, we'd have a really strong um, stance on this. But we see that when it comes to strength, males and females seem to respond similarly in terms of their relative gains. So females are able to gain strength at the same rate as males, but the difference is males are starting at a higher innate baseline that if you take the average untrained male and the average untrained female, the male is higher. So a 5% increase in strength is going to, if I'm 100 kg and a female is um, 50 kg, say half my weight, if we both increase our bench press 10%, well, now I'm going up, uh, say if we both can do body weight and we both increase 10%, well, I've increased 10 kg where the females increase 5 kg. Yeah. So I've absolute, in absolute terms, I've got twice as strong gain in terms of gains as, as the female. So relatively, they might gain the same, but the absolute gap will keep widening as you gain at the same relative pace. That's fascinating. No, that's that's a very interesting thing to think about. And when when you dig into this, so like it, it's a you know like socially and from a regulation point of view, uh, it makes so much sense to uh, ch- change women's sports to wearing white shorts to prevent that self consciousness and all of that. That's a actually a fantastic example. That just it's such a light bulb moment of duh, you know that yeah. makes that makes so much sense. Why was this not happening before? But from a training point of view, what are some like um, some pl- things that women could do differently than maybe because I, I assume there's an awful lot of everyone gets the same personal training plan. Everyone gets the same thing, mm. man, woman. Is there anything that could be done better specifically for women? Because I'm sure most of the research into defining personal training is probably more male focused. I'm, I, I'm shooting in the dark here, but would there be anything that you would advise for women to keep in mind to kind of optimize their own training? Yeah, I think, so this is an interesting one. When we look, as I say, at the evidence, and again, this is where I think the science is maybe jumping ahead of itself and we're not, so you have this idea of phase-based training that we see or proponent, and this would be the idea that like for the menstrual cycle, you can go into several different phases, but if you were to look at very simplistically, you have two major phases. You have the follicular phase and the luteal phase. And the follicular phase, you know, um, starts, well, it actually starts at the start of your period. You could say after menses, and you see the, the, the stimulate, but you see high levels of estrogen. This is typically what we call the follicular phase. And estrogen um, is an anabolic hormone. We see that, you know, theoretically, and this is the problem again, is females are not textbooks, so don't follow the textbook. Um, if you look at it from a textbook perspective, well, when estrogen is high, you should be in an anabolic state, you should be stronger, have more energy, be able to recover better. And then in the luteal phase, which um, it's, it's not um, where you have progesterone, which is not a catabolic hormone, but it's anti-estrogenic. Mm-hmm. Um, we see that, well, you should be weaker, have less energy, not recover as well. So this has led to this idea. And again, this is based on theory or theoretical understanding rather than empirical evidence that, well, you should do your hard training, your heavy hard training in the follicular phase, and then maybe go easier in the luteal phase. And that could lead to better gains that you, you know, do more reps, more sets, higher weight when you're feeling better and potentially more anabolic and you uh, go easier and do your down week um, in the luteal phase. Now. Again, there's no strong evidence to support that that's superior to than just traditional straight normal exercising and not doing this phase-based approach. But again, there's not a lot of research there. So my stance might um, change uh, as we go forward as more evidence looks at the efficacy of that. I just personally think that when we look at the effect of the menstrual cycle on performance, we will, I don't think we're anywhere near to making blanket recommendations. And I, I, I almost find it insulting in a way where oh my bad <laughs> no no not that way but as in some people it, it's funny again people don't realize their own dissonance sometimes where we have people that are saying women are not small men we need to understand that there's you know they have their own uniqueness and we need more research in the area more and then in the other way they're turning around saying well you're a woman therefore in the flicker phase this is how you will feel and this is how you will behave and i'm like you can't say that because what we do know about the effect of the menstrual cycle it's highly individual. Mm-hmm. Some females report that, you know, during their period, they're white, they're, they're bed bound. Some, some, yeah. some 
you ask them, they don't know what even they had the month on it. That literally has no effect upon them. So we see it's hugely variable between individuals, but then also variable from cycle to cycle that one month is very different symptoms to another month, if any. So you can't make these strong blanket recommendations. All you can say is, well, track your own period over three to six months, try to identify patterns. If there are any, there might not be any patterns, but if there are concurrent or consistent patterns, well, then put some coping strategies in place that help you as an, as an individual. But anyway, um, that's one factor. And then people neglected about half of um, premenopausal population that are um, 16 or above are on hormonal contraceptive yes. use anyway. So we focus all on the menstrual cycle, but that's disregarding half of the population anyway. But where I'm saying is the science is jumping ahead is we're getting bogged down in should we be doing these advanced protocols, these phase-based training, when one, we still don't have high-quality research to show that the menstrual cycle even affects performance. We have this dichotomy in the literature where when we look at the subjective, that yes, a high prevalence of females report that the menstrual cycle, there's a high level of symptoms and there's a high level of, they say it affects your performance. Objectively measured in the lab, no strong evidence to support this. The menstrual cycle phase has a difference. Now, what that tells me is <clears throat> trying to find a group average, a group mean in the lab to something that's highly variable and individual. So mm-hmm. we, what more interests me is we need to identify, well, who does it have an impact on? And why does it have an impact on those and not someone else? So the inter-individual differences um, interest me more in that area. But let's peel it back and we need to answer these fundamental questions. Well, let's not go try to optimize the mentor cycle for training before we even understand does it have an impact on performance? And then step it back from that again, we're trying to optimize around the menstrual cycle when we just don't have enough girls and women playing sport or exercising, doing resistance training at all. So what we see in, in, when we look at the epidemiology of injury research, females on average in field-based sports and most sports are roughly three times more likely to rupture their ACL in the knee than male counterparts. And there are some leading hypotheses around this, around we used to think that it was Q angle, the angle of the, the femurs into the hips. We kind of see when you standardize for, for height, Q angle doesn't actually differ that much between males and females. Um, the other one was around laxis, laxicity of the tendons due to um, different phases of menstrual cycle. You can see difference in laxicity. But for me, what I would say would, if you were to look at what would account for most of the variance when we see here is women on average are weaker than men. And I don't say that um, kind of in a condescending way. I'm like, if you take the average male rugby player at 18 years of age, you take the average male Irish international at 18 years of age, they've probably come through a private school where they've been in the gym and had good strength and conditioning sports since maybe 12 years of age. So you take them at 18 years of age, they have six years of really good resistance training behind them, strength training. You take the average 18-year-old international female, you're lucky if they have any resistance training history between them or behind them. They maybe started at 16, 17, if you're lucky. Most probably haven't because from a kind of historical and societal um, background, we just don't encourage adolescent girls to engage in resistance training and if they play sport that we don't do the S and C with them. Now, thankfully it has changed in recent years and we're uh, seeing a big difference there. So that's a major difference. If you take the average 18 year old male and female rugby player, one has six years gym experience, the other has none, but we put them on the pitch and expect them to play the same games, twisting, turning impacts. When we look at the biggest risk factor um, in injury risk across most sports, well, previous injury, if you disregard that, if you've been injured before, that increases your risk of being injured again. Strength, muscular strength is one of the um, biggest risk factors. Weaker athletes get injured more. So is it a case that, well, the difference in ACL injury risk is because well, females are just built differently or is it, well, we just, they just don't have the same training age or training background in terms of strength levels. Because if we take weak athletes and we make them stronger, we see it has a massive um, impact on injury risk injury risk really comes down so if we as a society start to just encourage more girls and adolescents to engage in good quality gym-based strength training and to support their sport 
Now, obviously, we don't want to, there's a big difference between, you know, that kind of fit, fitness culture. We don't want to go down. But if we're saying, well, look, it's good for your health. You need to play sport. You want to be strong for your sport. And we overcome the barriers that females have to resistance training and gym culture because it's an intimidating place for a lot of people to go. So if we can change the attitude at the societal level, well, then if we get more people just have a basic background in strength training and SNC for sport, then let's focus on, well, how can we optimize it? Because we even haven't got people doing it at the basic level yet before we go optimizing it, because that's actually one of the biggest issues. If you want to do really good um, sex difference studies with resistance training element, on average, it's hard to find, say, if I want to do a, a one rep max or the most weight you can lift in a back squat where you have a bar on your back, I will easily be able to recruit a group of males who can do that technically very well. Very difficult for me to regroup. If, if I take the average male rugby team, most of them will be able to do it well or be able to do it well with a little bit of tweaking. Average female rugby team, they might not have back squatted before. They've no experience in it. So from an ethical perspective, mm -hmm. there's the level of injury risk in just testing them is too high. So therefore, we can't use that as a measure. So it's these, these factors, I think. So again, I suppose to summarize there and not go on too many tangents, what females should do differently is just engage in resistance training. If it's something that you're hesitant about, there's a lot of barriers. It's very good for your health. If you play sport, it's going to benefit your sport. If you just um, want to train for health and live a long and healthy life, resistance training is key, key to that. So just engage with it. And there's plenty of people that will help you um, along there and again we've seen the culture change where we do have a lot more females participating in resistance training so that's that's great so just do it first and foremost learn the basics do it well in terms of your menstrual cycle there's no blanket recommendations it's about learning your own body so track your own menstrual cycle try to identify patterns there are some apps you can do you flow fitter woman there's different apps that can help you do this but if anyone is telling you this is how you should specifically train or eat based on your menstrual cycle, that's snake oil salesman. That can't be done because there's some large companies that are claiming that, but that's not science-based. If you're on hormonal contraceptives, doesn't seem to impact performance that much. There might be a trivial um, impact on performance um, by taking hormonal contraceptives. But for most people, the benefits to get from hormonal contraceptives far outweighs a potential trivial detriment and adaptation and um, unless you're at the elite level why would you even care or, or consider about that um so they're the main things you don't need to train differently to to males it doesn't seem we don't have strong evidence for that yet um so this idea you you get this oh females should lift light weights and high reps because your muscle is different no the principles of training are still the same you have to put the same level of stress on the body to get similar adaptations so the way that females adapt to training might be different we don't know yet um but the way you should train them in the large is is pretty much the same you should train the same as, as the males and we, we tend to see it in older adults um they tend to go in and they're afraid to lift heavy weights or they think they need to train differently because they're old muscle is muscle depending on you know what i mean it's still going to respond to the same stress yes you've slight morphological differences between males and females and as you age but in the large it's use it or lose it, and you need to put a decent amount of stress on it to make it stronger and make it grow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sorry, I went on a... <laughs> no, no, a that was... There. No, that was absolutely class. And I, I, I think it was... Um, what was very, very fascinating about it was you really brought home the we're trying to act like we're in the golden age whilst we're in the middle of the stone ages, whilst we're trying to... We don't have the detail to take every single individual and every single person with their individual differences and, and say to a lot of people, this is exactly how you should do it. You brought it right back down to basics, right back down to the foundation of, at the moment, probably the most important sex differences is kind of sex inequality in sports and exercise attendance in the first place. And you have to match that first. And it's only really above that that you could even consider looking at your individual differences to optimize it for you and that the science for you isn't there as much as the general what's good for you is and that is 
that is so fascinating and i so it, you, you said that just so well very good <laughs> i'm a bit taken back that was excellent i i think what what really strikes me there is like you said there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there and there are a lot of people saying that and i find that a lot as well in like medicine and drugs and general health where people say oh this works for women and it's like and you have to reel it back in and say some women or some men there are people who benefit from certain things but it's not a broad spectrum thing and i I think it's just fascinating the way you went through that and you even see that in your you for more the biomedical sphere in terms of the threshold for what in terms of you take a, a clinical drug or a pharmacological um drug in terms of just because a clinical study shows it has a benefit that is on average for a certain proportion of people that is not for everyone who who took it um so what what fascinates me in terms of research is i'm really fascinated inter-individual differences more than anything else and we see that and what i mean by inter-individual is how different people respond um and it, it is really fascinating because even if we talk about exercise and writing an exercise program for someone, we don't know how someone's going to respond. We write an exercise program, and it's our best estimation based upon our understanding of you and people similar to you of how we think you will respond. But you see huge variance in how people respond to exercise. Um, some people, as, and again, anecdotally, we see this. Some people gain strength and size very quickly. Other people, are it's difficult for them to, to, to gain. So you have this huge variance. We just know on average, if you do this on the average person, but who is the average person? So you've huge variance between people um, in how they respond. And again, that's physiological, but also if you take in the biopsychosocial aspect of it, how we appraise um, training to make, like, for example, if you take, um, if you go into neuroscience into your area and, it, and you look at the effect of the placebo, that's one of the most fascinating effects we have and i think was it neurofen in australia were actually fined because they had um painkillers for period um cramps and period symptoms um where again in all the and they arranged them they've, you have neurofen for headache you've they yep. all contain the exact, exact same, same thing um, and yeah. thing and if you pay more money for a painkiller it's more effective than the cheap painkiller that's the exact same yeah. so we, we see this Again, I, I'm not really sure what my point is here. <laughs> it's this that everyone is individual and it's fascinating mm-hmm. that blanket recommendations, like as a, and this is why public health initiatives and health promotion is so difficult because we need to come up with a heuristic. Well, what's the best advice we can give that, you know, helps the most amount of people in the best way we can? It's, and this is why I hate when you hear people like BMI is stupid, body mass index, you know, as it says oh I, I did it on if you do it on a rugby player it says they're fat it's like well yes but it's not meant to measure at an individual level it's yeah. we can't put a uh, hundred thousand people in indexa but if we go to the every time someone visits gp we take their height and weight which is quick and cheap yeah on a population level we can identify trends so it's these type of things that advice we give as a heuristic that look if you can't get individual help do this and it'll probably yeah. work for you reasonably well. That's what we're trying to do with health promotion, these initiatives. We're not trying to give specific advice that is so good that it helps everyone as an individual. Yeah. And I think that's uh, something which I kind of feel every now and then, especially because I'm a huge advocate for sex differences, but sex differences is just one direction in which you can cut the population in half. That also happens to make it quite useful to do beneficial science because <laughs> really you could then split it into lots of different sections you could take what about men with a higher than average testosterone men with a lower than average testosterone you could take women with higher or lower estrogen you could take women with longer menstrual cycles and shorter men you could break it up into different heights different ages different angles of their bones different um axes for um how how good their levers are in their body, shorter levers, longer levers. You can break it up into any which way you want. And I think sex differences is just, for me anyway, sex differences, the very first step 
in just saying we are not all the same? What is the first way we can split the population? Because in reality, that's not enough. In reality, I think for me, the goal of sex differences isn't like we're going to revolutionize everything. We're, we're just going to say we're going to make recommendations more optimized for different halves of the population. And I would my goal would be in future, and I'm sure it's the same for you, in my 30 years, you would then be saying, right, this is more beneficial for women. We will try that. Okay, this did or it did not work for you. What is the next What is the next thing on the recommendation? Will you also have this characteristic? So we're going to try this or that. And I, th I think we're building there. But like you said, right now, the science isn't there. The science isn't there for saying that right now. But I think in future, it's something that we are building building towards and like you said there is that ethical center that we currently live in where if you have a headache you should take paracetamol and if you and then the marketing side of it as well which is just a whole other thing it's 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 interesting i like that terminology in terms of sex difference if you're thinking of well if you have the population as a whole and we're essentially trying to build a flow diagram of breaking up individual um recommendations sex difference is just that first layer yeah. Um, we understand that fundamentally, then we can strand off and start to get better and better as science goes on. That's a nice way of, of, of conceptualizing. I, re I really like that. Steal and it. use it. Yeah. <laughs> but that's what like people I often tell students is like the difference is like, um, especially in artists or um, business or that good people steal or good people borrow, great people steal. And the difference oh. is. If you borrow something, you don't change it because you have to give it back. If you steal something, it's then yours and it's yours to mold and build mm. on it and create. But what I think then is important when you talk about this, well, sex differences are the first. People then, when you have to understand sex differences, we're not just talking about the menstrual cycle. There's far more to it oh. than just, just you know, yeah. the, the reproductive yeah. system. That's Absolutely. one element where yeah. you, you go into to different um, areas I, because yeah. even there's... I, even if you take sex hormones as there's one thing that again, and this is you go down these rabbit holes and it gets more complex. So one of the issues that we see in high quality studies around sex differences is even if they account for the menstrual cycle, they usually don't um, take blood samples to actually confirm menstrual cycle phase. Um, now, so you're saying, well, we need to take blood samples. So that's uh, expensive. What's interesting, if you take exercise, if you take circulating estrogen, that doesn't actually correlate to intramuscular estrogen. So, so I take a blood sample. I don't know what level of estrogen in the muscle, so I can't infer based on your blood sample. Now, again, I mixed up here. There's one, and then you take it um, uh, testosterone as well. I think people neglect the role of testosterone in the female then as well, and I don't know why that, I think, hasn't been looked at at all. You take testosterone, um, similar thing, but... I'm trying to think now in, in females, total testosterone doesn't seem to correlate very well with the differences in adaptations. But if you look at free testosterone, yes, it does have a, a difference. But if you take free testosterone, I think intramuscular free testosterone correlates with strength increases, but not hypertrophy. But circulating free testosterone correlates with hypertrophy, but not with strength. But or it's the other way around, it's yeah, vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So if this is what I find is you peel back one layer and what, and you're like, okay. And then you end up saying, I should have just done my PhD with male participants and I would have been done by now. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 I, and, and I, I, I would have been out. Yeah. I can relate it, to this it's so, interesting. so much. I can relate to and this then, so, so much because we have the exact same issue um, in the brain where cells, uh, cells within themselves can produce estrogen and they can produce testosterone. They can convert it themselves and it happens a lot in the brain. And that conversation comes up all the time, especially because a lot of what I focus on is postmenopause. And then it comes into that exact conversation of how sure are we that the difference we're seeing is because of menopause or because of something happening within the brain. And it's, it's something that every time I just have to put my hands up and say, I don't have an answer. There's no way for me to have a, an answer on that right now, especially in the brain. Because it's such a it's such a no go zone. So, I, yeah, it's, I relate it's to constantly that. just asking what assumptions are we making here and what what leaps are we making, and that's what makes it. I won't say. Someone asked me um, today on on social media like, "What oh, does it frustrate you about whatever?" I was like, 
no, as I because I tend to be quite stoic, and I think that's why I haven't gone insane yet with the the PhD. But I was like, my frustration wouldn't actually make a difference to the situation. It would just yeah. have a negative impact on me. But it it's frustrating when you see people, and this is why ignorance is bliss. Um, that they're so confident in what they're saying. It's like, well, this is what estrogen does. This is what progesterone does. Therefore, you should, you know, train this way. And I'm like, oh, if you un- only understood the complexity, it's like, and again, you, people talk about, and again, I don't want to tell you, but you look at testosterone, estrogen, uh, in the females, you tend to, it's usually estrogen and progesterone people talk about. Yep. If they know a bit more, they'll go into FSH and LH. But then, if you really dig into it, you're looking at all the different precursors that lead to there. And then you're looking at, well, is that precursor, is it sulfurated, unsulfurated? And then you're like, yeah, yeah. And, and this, and they all act upon different receptors based upon their, and again, you can just go down this and then you're like, what, what do I know? And then you start to question, well, do we even bother measuring it? Or do we just look at outcome based research? And if we do this and we look at what's the outcome, is that a better way and more ecologically valid that's a great term you can use when you don't want to do the hard stuff it's like we (laughs) made it ecologically valid (laughs) oh yeah it's it's extremely complex but i think we covered a lot of the the (laughs) relevant stuff i think and uh but like like in that i think this this the way we ended this conversation i think is important because i think as much as it's so important for people to like engage with science and appreciate it and all of that, the uncertainty needs to be discussed and the uncertainty needs to, people need to appreciate where that line is drawn and I, I and where the problems are. And even though it sounds like at times, like we've been had a few giggles and a few laughs towards the end, but it, it is, a, it is a problem and it is a problem. And it's, it's one that, um, isn't easily solved right now but that does not like you said necessarily mean a lot of the things we've said aren't true because a lot of the research we've mentioned and a lot of the things we said we've mentioned what's rock solid and i think you especially did a very good job of mentioning what was rock solid versus what was just theoretical versus what things were leaning in a certain direction as well so on that also go, go on no i was just going to say just because I just want to make sure people are getting the, the right message before I go, because as you said, you said very rightly there, say that theoretical stuff, we're, we're self-proclaimed nerds. We enjoy going down the rabbit holes and having these, talking about the nuances and, and the complexities. But that's, that's kind of, that's what academics do sitting in this ivory tower. And again, we enjoy those conversations, but do they actually help people? It's like It helps people appreciate that, oh, it's complex. But in terms of what people need to take away, there's it's very like public health messages the science we can go de- as deep down the rabbit hole as we want but this main message you take in terms of anything in terms of your health get your if you follow the physical activity guidelines it's the best heuristic it's going to do a lot is the science of health and exercise very complex of course it is but you as an individual listening and as a female you can appreciate it's complex but the messages you take away is resistance training is good for my health good for my sport and even if people say oh girls shouldn't be in the gym nonsense um you go you do it um sport again whether it doesn't have to be competitive even if it's just social and we see something like um the mothers and fathers programs with the ga is fantastic examples go play tag rugby if you don't want to be competitive or whatever it may be um just engage in sport appreciate your own mental cycle listen to it identify patterns but that's what all you need to know in terms of practical takeaways if you want to go down the rabbit hole it's complex but you don't need to worry yourself with that just get out exercise go to the gym and participate in sport or whatever you can do that makes you physically active and then in terms of your own mental health be comfortable enough to talk about it with your coaches with your peers um, and then obviously if there's anything that comes up that doesn't seem right if you start missing your periods to become highly irregular or just something doesn't feel right go talk to your gp don't be embarrassed to to reach out and get help because the mentor cycle um we have this again it's a banal statement where people say oh it's taboo it's not every coach i've ever talked to it's more than happy to talk about it it's something we make taboo in our own heads but people have no issue talking about it um so if it's something you're concerned about 
instead of dropping out of the sport, talk to your coaches and your peers and whoever, and there's stuff we can there to help you deal with whatever you're dealing with, because it's not just you. Thousands of players beforehand have dealt with the same thing. So it's not a reason to drop out of sport or not engage in exercise. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. That was absolutely class, David. Um, I certainly think that was unbelievable. And I hope we can get you on another time. Cheers. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Andrew. This is the end of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time. If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned, why don't you give us some of your money? Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon.